1987, IBM Corporation was set to release IBM OS2. OS2 was going to be the next big thing in the world of operating systems, probably bigger than even, well, the innovative Windows 95 that you see here. What happened? Why did it fail? What was it even like? Let's explore and some more. Welcome back to another episode of Retro Tech Bytes. Let's take a step back and a step forward and talk about the different trajectories that OS2 and Microsoft Windows took. What you see here is not Microsoft Windows 3.x. It's not 3.1 or 3.0, the usual one that you see for, you know, DOS gaming PCs. This is Microsoft Windows NT 3.51, which was released in 1995. NT 3.51 was the final evolution in the NT 3 series, which was Microsoft's attempt at creating a stable 32-bit object-oriented operating system. While OS 2 and Microsoft Windows certainly share a storied past together as almost siblings, OS 2 took a different approach. Unlike the program manager that Windows NT 3.5 used, which was shared with Windows 3.1, OS 2 used the workplace shell, which was far more modern, sleek, and in many ways, innovative. The workplace shell looks like something more out of a Macintosh than out of a PC. It's far more sleek and confined, but also quite usable and almost clear to the user as to what they're looking at. It's more innovative and intuitive. So let's talk a little bit about OS2 itself and its history. OS2 was first developed in 1987 as part of a joint development agreement between Microsoft and IBM. OS2 in its initial iterations was a single user multitasking OS and it was designed for the 286. It required, actually, higher memory standards than Microsoft Windows at the time, allowing the 286 to address the full 16 megabytes of memory space and take advantage of all of that. The thing is, the presentation manager, which became the workplace shell that was used, it was derived semi from Windows 2.0, but it was also different. It was similar looking in the early versions of OS 2, but as OS 2 evolved, so too did the GUI, just like in Microsoft's Windows. Speaking of Microsoft, it's important to recall and reiterate that OS2 was initially developed as a joint project with Microsoft. In fact, this early version that you see here was actually bundled and sold as Microsoft OS2. So anyway, why OS2? Well, IBM had the PS2, so OS2 was the operating system for the personal system too. OS2 was developed between Microsoft and IBM, and this agreement that the two of them signed dates back to 1987. Now, take a look for a moment. You notice that uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit sticker? Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. OS2 became the sort of wedge between Microsoft and IBM, at least in the operating system space. OS2 was more complicated than DOS, more expensive than Windows, and frankly, to the average consumer, it just didn't make sense. It was too expensive, and all the features it supported weren't really needed, since most software at the time was still being written for MS-DOS. To make matters worse, OS2's earliest versions were straight up command line. They didn't possess a graphical user interface, so why buy it? Sure, you could take advantage of the 286's virtual memory addressing, but I mean, that's a feature that the average end user didn't care about, and frankly, their hardware might not even have been supported due to lack of drivers. OS2 was a mess in its early days, and the division between Microsoft and IBM certainly didn't help the situation and led to OS2 not being able to grab a foothold in the consumer market. That is to say, from a technical standpoint, OS2 is a masterpiece. It's stable, it's fast, it handles all sorts of complex and almost over-the-top features, at least in context of its time. But as far as OS2 being an actual saleable product? Oh no. Consumers had no intention to buy something that, well, they wouldn't be consuming. So. Microsoft and OS2? Yeah, not bound to last. IBM, however, saw things differently. They uh, blamed Microsoft for OS2 being only to capture something like 6% of the market. OS2, in a sense, was a commercial failure. But in another sense, OS2 was a technological marvel. It was so far ahead of its time in terms of its capabilities. It could run Windows programs, it could run DOS programs, and it was stable and it was fast. It could do both, but it had the hardware requirements necessary to do like what that sounds. So when you're talking about hardware, yeah, most consumers didn't have that hardware. And again, another issue and another reason for lack of sales. 
Even so, IBM tried to market OS2 as something that it probably was and probably wasn't. A better Windows than Windows, a better DOS than DOS. Was it both? Well, we'll take a look at that in a little bit. But let's just say that being a better DOS than DOS and a better Windows than Windows was a tough sell. That being said, OS2 was highly compatible with Windows and highly compatible with DOS. And if anything, OS2 was nothing short of one of the most compatible operating systems, at least for the time. It had support for Windows 3.1, it had support for MS-DOS, it had support for practically almost every modern and major piece of software that had been written at the time, at least for the x86 space. And sure, OS2's presentation manager had a highly advanced API, but with highly advanced things comes lots of documentation, and lots fewer reasons to sell. Again, take a look at this. 3,000 pages for presentation manager's documentation. I mean, that sounds like pretty typical IBM, certainly, but at the same time, that does not sound like a product that the average consumer wants to buy. That being said, the technical reference, as referenced in this document here, is $210, just for the technical reference. The programmer's toolkit, $787. I mean, we're talking about ridiculously expensive software for ridiculously expensive hardware. The PS2 systems that this ran on, yeah, if you're not familiar, they were probably some of the most expensive computers that you could buy at the time. Even in spite of its commercial shortcomings, OS2 trudged on as something of a technological masterpiece in a performative model. It was fast, it was compatible, it was, you know, all over the place as far as the ability to run everything from DOS programs to Windows programs to OS2 specific programs. It was a masterpiece if you wanted compatibility. But in many ways, it was a jack of all trades and a master of none. That was the real problem underlying OS2. But just because it was a problem didn't mean that the operating system was unusable. No, 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 not at all. OS2 really found itself in the corporate and embedded spaces where networking was important and its memory management and all sorts of extended multitasking features could be taken advantage of. For example, in networking intensive applications, OS2 was highly successful. Before we go any further, it's important to take a look at how IBM marketed OS2 and perhaps comment as to why that led to the operating system's failure. Not all personal computer operating systems give you your best shot. Some will do several things at once, but not always. Chalk one up for IBM's advanced OS2. It runs any number of programs simultaneously, seamlessly, safely. Get more work done. Power up any IBM compatible like the new Amber 486s with OS2. I can't believe you're running a video and you've got the internet going here and a fax. Did you notice that it's not missing to be here? And how do you do all this at the same time? Phone dial and record video right from the desktop. Database, spreadsheet, communication, the whole thing. I like how easy it is to go back and forth. Everything together around 90 bucks. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. OS2 Warp, a totally cool way to run your computer. So yeah, in typical IBM fashion, OS2 was a complicated work product. So complicated, in fact, that the marketing itself was complicated. Here's some boxes of OS2 that were offered for sale. These are some of the different versions that you would see, and none of them were cross-compatible. Take a look at that red box. That version is known as the Red Spine version of OS2 Warp 3. It did not contain compatibility for DOS and Windows built in. Compare that with the blue box of OS2 Warp Connect. That contained compatibility for DOS and Windows, and it contained networking. Would the average end user be able to figure that out? Probably not. The thing is, and I guess what I'm trying to say is, OS2 basically lacked an identity. Was it a corporate product? Was it a commercial product? It tried to be both, and it failed. But in failure, there were various successes. So let's take a look and highlight some of the more interesting aspects of OS2. Here I'm going to install OS2 on the world's fastest 386 and get it running on some old IBM hardware. OS2 might seem like it's a complicated product to install. In fact, here's some footage of the install sped up 2,000%.
Sure, it wasn't exactly an easy process, but I wouldn't call it arduous either. It was quite doable, and even without any real technical expertise, compared to Windows it was pretty much a cinch, with two discs and a CD for OS2 Warp 3. The process itself didn't really take too long. I mean, if you're not familiar with the world's fastest 386, uh, I'll put a link at the top here, but basically what we're talking about is a 75 megahertz IBM Blue Lightning. At its performance peak, the Blue Lightning is pretty much equal to a 486DX266. So the system's no slouch, but the thing is, eh, installing any graphical operating system on a DX266 can be a pain. And OS2 wasn't too bad actually. It installed pretty quick and it offered me right away networking because I used Warp 3 Connect Blue Spine Edition, which I previously mentioned, so I could get that Windows and DOS compatibility. As far as the actual Windows and DOS compatible part, yeah, that's automatically installed. I installed this on a blank compact flash card and was able to get all of the features of the operating system right away. I didn't have to tweak anything, I was able to select what I wanted, and much like a typical Windows install, once it walked through the steps, it was pretty much self-explanatory. The actual installer portion itself, that probably took the most time, just watching that really pretty OS2 bar go by. So yeah, as someone who had never really messed with OS2 before, besides reading about it on Wikipedia, I would say that the install process was pretty simple. It was straightforward, it was no more complicated than installing Windows 95, and in fact I would even argue it was perhaps more self-explanatory because it set itself up afterward. I didn't have to configure any drivers, I didn't have to install anything specific, and the hardware in the world's fastest 386 will be detailed below in the description, but for the most part it's pretty standard stuff. I mean, even the Sound Blaster Pro 2 was captured by IBM OS2, and the drivers were installed just fine. No problem at all. It even got my video card, which was a Trident 9440. And speaking of the video card, I actually did install the Trident drivers because the IBM provided drivers were a little bit less sophisticated and really meant for the older Trident 8900 series. The Trident 9440 drivers were actually quite nice and enabled some GUI acceleration and allowed me to load in a resolution of 1280 by 1024 which was, you know, perfectly usable. I only set it to 800 by 600 just for readability's sake, but 1280 by 1024 on OS2 actually looked pretty good. I was impressed. The other thing I was really impressed with as far as OS2 was the actual speed. Using the operating system never felt sluggish. I've got a pair of 16 megabyte fast page mode sims in the system. And in fact, if you're hearing something right now, that's OS2 sound effects in the background. And yeah, system doesn't really slow down even when it's playing sounds or opening, closing various windows. It's pretty impressive for what this thing can do with basically a hopped up 386. In fact, it's impressive enough that, well, let's try playing some of the included MIDI files and see what we can get. Some of these IBM included jams are actually a little bit better than canyon.mid. Okay, so what about the Windows portion of the OS? Well, clicking on that folder that says Windows Programs, you can actually open a version of Program Manager known as WinOS2. WinOS2 is basically a full copy of Windows 3.1 that runs as part of OS2. It's running underneath the operating system and you're basically running Windows on top of OS2, but the performance difference isn't really too great. You know, nothing seems less snappy than usual. I mean, program manager still seems perfectly adequate. And 
It has all the usual installed accessories and features. I mean, it even has the MIDI player, which when I uploaded the drivers for the Creative Sound Blaster 2.0 that's in the system, I was able to get some MIDI playback going, but this is where I started to run into issues with OS2. But if you really want to see just how compatible OS2 is with Windows and DOS, let's take a look at the Sound Blaster Pro 2 install. These are the install floppies that came with the card for the CT1600. They're meant for DOS, and here I am running them in a DOS window, and they ran just fine. In fact, they ran literally how you would expect on any DOS-based system that was running an IBM Blue Lightning 386 at 75 MHz. I mean, there was literally no difference between running this in PC-DOS 2000, which is what I previously had the system on, and in OS 2. Except... Alright, yeah, it is running a little bit slower than normal, and that can probably be accounted for due to memory management as well as running DOS on top of OS 2. Because keep in mind, OS2 itself is its own operating system. The versions of DOS and Windows that are built into it are running basically alongside of or on top of it, depending on how you're looking at it. So from that perspective, there is going to be some performance loss and overhead instead of in just installing it on the bare metal of the system itself. That being said, I mean, everything works as you'd expect. Take a look at this. I'm going to play some of the sound test tracks and they work just like they would in DOS or in Windows 3.1. Even cooler is that the Windows driver installer portion of the actual install for the creative card caught the version of Windows that's running as WinOS 2 and was able to install the Windows drivers too for the Windows portion of the card. It worked just fine and I didn't have to do anything specific. I mean literally all I did was continue with the install, open up program manager, it was there. Open up DOS, it showed up. Everything looked like I was using a regular system except I was using OS2 and doing all of this on top of the existing operating system. It was really cool and it kind of showed off the versatility of OS2. See, even Microsoft agrees with me. I mean, clearly the system itself is pretty impressive and versatile. So just to test out that versatility, we've played MIDI files in OS2 itself. Let's try playing some of those WinOS2 MIDI files in Windows. So I'm going to pull up canyon.mid, which is the included MIDI file that comes with Windows 3.1. I mean, everyone's heard it, it's pretty iconic, but I still want to give it a test, if not for the memes, for the actual testing aspect. Let's take a look. Now, if you've heard this before, you probably are thinking, that's not quite right. And, well, it's not. My suspicion is that there's something going on with the MIDI mapper, especially since this is Windows being run on top of OS2, but I'm not quite certain. Anyway, let's get to what everyone really likes to see and play some games with this thing. So here we're going to check out Doom in OS2 versus its performance in PC-DOS on the same system. Again, this is the same world's fastest 386, and... Yeah, well, take a look here.
In all honesty, you can really see the overhead that OS 2's DOS and Windows implementations provide, and certainly the performance is adequate, but not acceptable. I mean, I wouldn't call that playable. However, here's a full screen of Wolfenstein 3D being played, and apologies for the weird resolution, I'm not quite sure, but apparently OS 2 is just weird about those things. That being said, OS 2 runs Wolf 3D just fine, and this is the unmodified DOS version. But if you look closely and listen closely, you might notice there's certain sound effects that aren't just playing at all. And I'm not exactly sure what that's about, but yeah, OS 2 things, I guess. Realistically though, that's not what OS2 is for. Let's explore a little bit of what it could actually do, which would be, you know, multitasking. So I'll pull up Windows Write, and then I'll pull up an OS2 application. In this case, I'll just pull up the driver panel for the uh, Trident TGUI 9440 that's in there. And yeah, works as intended. I mean, OS2 was a multitasking OS, and yep, it can multitask across Windows, across DOS, and across OS2 without a problem. But let's push the envelope a little more and try something more interesting. What if you wanted to run an OS2 application and you also wanted to run Doom? Well, there was an OS2 version of Doom. That being said, it was a beta, but there was an OS2 version of Doom. So yeah, let's check it out. Was OS2 a success or a failure? Well, that's complicated. It lives on today in embedded systems and ATMs and the like, and it even ran New York City's subway. But the fact remains, OS2 was nothing short of a technological marvel, especially at its time. That being said, like all marvels, it was quirky at best. 
Is it worth another look? Absolutely. Is it a blast and totally interesting? Absolutely. Do I recommend checking it out? Absolutely. Thanks again for watching, and this has been another episode of Retro Tech Bites.